Black History Month. Atiya Chaudhary organized a face-to-face -face meeting for GMBAM leaders and MBMEN leaders on Friday, 1st of October, start of Black History Month at the Manchester Art Gallery. Mosley Street, a conversation with Dr. Halima Begum, Chief Executive Officer, the Runnymede Trust. The Runnymede Trust is the UK leading race equality think tank. Dr. Halima Begum is an institutional leader and social equity expert with 25 years experience initiating and managing UK government global and programs in efforts to reduce poverty and inequality across the world. She has worked with a range of partners, the European Commission, United Nations, World Bank, NGOs, and with bilateral agencies, work and lived in Bangladesh, China, Nepal, and Indonesia on long-term diplomatic assignments with the British government. I am Humaira Sana. I am from Pakistan. I'm, uh, I'm operational director of TV49 News. Um, I also work at Platball in Fallowfield. Um, which is part of Manchester City Galleries and uh, my role is community development lead and I've been working with lots of people for quite for many years but for the last couple of years I've been working with the Uncertain Futures advisory team which Atia, Louise, Tandeu and Patsy are members of. Um, and I'm also chair of governors at um, uh, Claremont Primary which is a majority Somali primary school in Mossad. Um, so within my ward um, and in my work in, uh, in the school and in my work in the uh, council where I'm particularly interested in children and young people, um, I'm very much involved and want to get to grips with and get us to get better at um, diversity work in the whole city um, and to get beyond Leading parallel lives. I would like to ask from the Atiya, you know, she done a very good job and uh, done too much for the community and uh, we will ask her, uh, Atiya, what we are doing today, please, and introduce her. Hello, Amir. So today we are having a conversation with Dr. Halima Begum, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Runnymede Trust. It's the leading race think tank in the UK and we're delighted that we're doing this today on the first day of Black History Month and having a conversation and introducing Halima for her inspirational work to our communities here in Manchester. So would you like to ask any question in behalf of me to her? I just want uh, Halima to tell you about her role uh, which would be fantastic and how important it is for us in race equality work. Yes, please. Thank you. It's really great to be here in Manchester today, 1st of October, Black History Month, but mostly really to meet amazing women leaders in, in our black and minoritized uh, community spaces to really understand what it is that you've been doing to lead us through this pandemic. And it's also the first opportunity to, to get out really, to meet people. So it's wonderful to just find that solidarity across the country that exists for race equality at the moment. I mean, there's something very special about how we're all coming together to build on that momentum from Black Lives Matter. So it's a pleasure to be here. And I can't wait to learn more about Manchester and how Manchester's communities are coming together to, to drive a lot of our work forward. Thank you very much for your time. Viewer, as you can see, we will come back with the latest news and more updates very soon. Mia Mirali, TV49 News, Manchester, UK. Highlights of the meeting on TV49 News, your community channel. It was the leading race equality think tank. We've been linked with it for many years. And your predecessor, uh, Omar, um, came several times and some of you may have attended. Um, the lectures that we put on during your, uh, Black History Month with Omar as well. Um, you're a true inspiration, Halima, so I'm absolutely privileged that you're here um, talking to us. Uh, you've been leading um, a great deal, um, and there is, are you, uh, you're an expert on um, social equity um, with over 25 years of experience around um, global matters on aid work and on reduction of poverty um, and inequality across the world, um, not just in the UK, and have worked with many partners, um, including the European Commission, the United Nations, the World Bank, 
So absolutely delighted um, that we've got somebody here. Um, truly, we can celebrate a fantastic role model um, for us all. So I'm going to um, just prompt Halima to tell us a little bit about herself and the work of the Running Mead, some of the priorities that we have today uh, from her point of view on race. But um, I'd very much like this to be a very interactive. So you know, we can't have that. Um, and even then, I think he, because he was a migrant worker, he hadn't finished university, uh, school in Bangladesh, rural Bangladesh. For him, the idea that anybody in his family, never mind the girls, would go to university was still quite difficult. Not because he resisted, because he, it was just outside of his wildest dream that anybody would. Because the only people that we knew went to university were like a few between, and they were like the iconic people. Um, I need to feel some love from our people <laughs> because it's been. Every time you go up and do this work, trust me, there's somebody who comes up really quickly. It will quote in the Daily Telegraph about how you, how you are just not um, patriotic about Britain, especially if your skin colour isn't white. So and that remains a talent for all of us. And sometimes yeah. there's unkindness within us, all sector, and I think we need to be supportive and oh, kind, we are, yeah. kind to ourselves oh. and really, um, you know, respect the work that in terms of the priorities we should be working on and supporting some of maybe the need priorities as well. I mean, we all have individual challenges and then there are professional ones. I suppose for most of my career, um, I was that person that didn't, didn't even know that I wasn't talking about race because all my conversations about race happened with my friends outside work. Um, and they were quite difficult conversations, um, and I didn't always understand that they were difficult until I brought them up. But I didn't have enough of those conversations inside the workplace. Because those conversations inside work always happened in the diversity work group. But I wondered whether we would have made more progress had we not had them just in the diversity work group. Should we not have had them in the canteens? in the conversations after hours, in every conversation, which might have created a better, more inclusive culture. I say that because um, now, because I'm in this running aid role, where it's like, I can talk about this any time I want and people don't leave the room. But it did make me feel... All the, like, different people from different organizations, they're sitting here, you know. Everybody is working very hard in a different way to against the, you know, bias might be discrimination or anything else or COVID, uh, helping the people in the COVID yet. But my question is this, you know, like, especially being an Asian, you know, when I'm working very hard, I'm just giving one of like up yeah. But we not being recognized, you know, why not we being recognized, you know, from the different bodies, you know. I mean, we are working more harder than anyone else, you know. We work day and night, we risk our life during the pandemic, we cover the NHS, we cover the uh, uh, vaccination centers, we been everywhere to distribute the food, we run the food bank, we went to the homeless people, we distribute the clothes, we, regardless of any race or anything, but, apart, uh, you know, I'm very confused about this one, up till now, you know, like, the other, uh, like, uh, we are working in the BM, like, for example, even if we build or apply for a little bit of grant, we are not getting any help from anywhere, but we get refused because we are working in a different languages, we have been for those people who don't understand the English in Punjabi, in Urdu, in other languages. But still we are not getting the response for that. What should we need to do for that? It's extremely key. I don't come across as a victim. Well, I don't push others as a victim. I think it's a conversation. It's a yeah. part of what blaming and victim code. It's about recognizing it's happening and how can we take steps forward. Yes, yes. And some people do blame, but you know, there's a space for that as well. But in our work, it looks at the talent of the team to bring that to the fore. So there are ways to do that. Um, we're not interested in blaming and naming. We're interested in, well, do you want to have the conversation and let's help you? Um, which is a very different take to how other organisations are looking at it. Um, to the point around East Asian groups being silenced, never being heard, you're absolutely right, and, and the COVID pandemic has actually laid open some of that viscerous hatred against 
uh, mainland Chinese communities that would have come here maybe 20 years ago, or came, as you were saying, at, at 12. There is research looking at uh, migrant groups that have come within the education system uh, at age 12 and 13 and so on. In fact, there are still uh, lots of Asian communities coming in with those age um, uh, groups. And I think, I think it's better that we connect up with our different communities to learn from each other. Keep watching TV49 News, your community voice, www.tv49news.co.uk. Contact number 0791615578 for Mia Mirali, Manchester, UK.